Hi, Professor Gassini here. In this part of the lecture, we're going to be speaking about n-gram language models. So first, let's start off by defining what an n-gram is. An n-gram is very simply a contiguous sequence of n items from a given sample of text or speech. These items can be phonemes, symbols, letters, words, whatever. So turning our attention to the right-hand side, the first two words in the paragraph that I just read an n-gram are an example of a bigram. n-gram is, is another example of a bigram. Is a, is another example of a bigram, and so on. Now, as I mentioned, grams don't only refer to words, they could refer to characters or letters as well. So a n space is one gram, is, is one trigram. n underscore n is another trigram. Underscore n Hyphen is another trigram, and so on. So you will encounter a little bit later in this course the notion of a skip gram, and so I thought we could cover it here. So a skip gram is a non-contiguous sequence of n items from a given sample of text or speech. So for example, if we had the sentence there on the right, an apple a day keeps a doctor away, the script grams could be an, and then notice we jumped over the word apple, a. That could be one of the skip grams. Apple, day, could be another one of the skip grams. A, keeps, could be a third skip gram, and so on. So now that we know what an n-gram is, we can talk about n-gram language models. A language model, by the way, is any sort of object that assigns probabilities to sequences of words. That sequence could be 10 words long, one word long, whatever you want. But if you have even just a lookup table that you put a word in one side and it gives you a probability of that word on the, on the other side, that's a language model. It's a very simple one, but it's a language model. Now, n-gram language models are really useful because they can leverage the statistical properties of language as they are embedded within the n-grams to perform useful operations in areas including speech recognition and grammar correction. So in speech recognition, for example, one thing that's very common is you'll have a set of words in a speech-to-text system, and when you want to predict, given the speech input, what the next word is, you're going to condition not only based on the audio that you received, but you're going to condition what the next word is based on the last several words that you saw. So that's where the language model kind of comes into play in a speech recognition system. Okay, the right way for you to understand language models and um, and gram based language models is I think again with an example. So let's look there on the right hand side for a minute and let's assume that we were asked to fill in a missing word in the following sentence. An apple, a blank, keeps the doctor away. Let's also assume that um, we were given the training data shown on the bottom left side of the screen there. A fish keeps for a day, a fish keeps well if you put it in a cold place, a fish keeps best if you put it in the fridge, but you'll be having a fish have it with an apple, because one apple a day keeps a doctor away. You know, they also say a day keeps coming. Okay, well, one, one way that we could go about trying to solve for what the missing value is in the sentence above is, is to look at the training data and say, hey, um, whenever I saw a keeps, what kinds of words in the skip gram sense, so a blank keeps, what was the blank in that training data? So if we just go back to the training data, you can see I've got some of the words highlighted there in purple. Uh, and, and that's the word fish. You can see then here on the, on the right-hand side of the screen, fish showed up exactly three times in my training data when my skip gram was a keeps. And similarly, the word day showed up twice when my skip gram was a keeps. So one of the things I could do is say, okay, well, I know that the skip gram showed up five times in my uh, training data. Seems like fish showed up 60% of the time three out of the five, and day showed up 40% of the time, or two out of the five. And therefore, if I had to make a guess, I would probably say that the answer is fish. Now, obviously this answer is wrong, and I did that, again, for illustrative purposes to say that when you train a model, it learns based on what you provide it. It doesn't have a, a special crystal ball that it uses to figure out anything about the world. It's just learning based on what you trained it with. Okay, now, in the previous example, we were looking at a skip gram where we only had a blank keeps. 
Well, we chose that just for the purpose of the example. We could actually make that skip gram use more of the neighboring words for the purposes of predicting the missing word in the middle. We could, for example, say, hey, I actually want apple A, and then I give it an, an arbitrary word followed by keeps the, I would find exactly one match with the word day, and I could then fill in the sentence correctly, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. I'm bringing this to your attention because the only thing we changed between the previous example and this example was the way that we decided to construct the n-gram. In one case, we made the n-gram a little bit longer. The context around basically the skipped word was longer. And in the previous case, we made that context shorter. Now, let's assume that we kept going with this. We said, hey, you know, worked great with two words. Why don't we, we take the context around the blank word and make it even wider? Why don't we use three words as the context? Well, if we did this and we now search the training data to find an instance where we had an apple A followed by a word, followed by keeps the doctor, we could look everywhere in the training data and we'd actually, there's no instance of that particular sequence that shows up anywhere within the training data. And so we would actually, our language model would be unable to fill in the missing word. I'm bringing this to your attention because in practice, when you're going to use n-gram language models to solve tasks, longer grams will mean sparser data, which means more locations without a match, just as we showed here. And shorter grams will mean more locations with match, but at the cost of important context, which might inhibit things about your performance. If this isn't totally intuitive in your mind yet, why we're using this? I think as you go through the homework assignment, which we'll step through a little bit together, it will be. Okay, let's consider another example here. Let's say that we wanted to fill in uh, the missing word in this sentence. An apple a day keeps the doctor blank. Now, instead of this being a skip gram problem, this is just a straight old n gram problem, right? I can have a training corpus. I can say, where did the word doctor showed up? what were all the words that showed up after that, and then I can have a, a probability here that says, hey, what's the likelihood of the, of the next word being heals, eats, aways, or riot, based on, on the fact that this word was doctor. And let's say for the purpose of the example that heals had the highest probability, I could put that in there. Well, what happens if we have two words that are missing? So instead of an apple a day keeps the doctor blank, we have an apple a day keeps the blank blank. Well, we can solve this problem by actually just kind of chaining the problem together one piece at a time. We can go and say, okay, hey, what's the probability of the first missing word, given that I saw the word the, and let's say for the purpose of this example that doctor was the most likely word, given the, and I'd fill that in. And then I can say, okay, well now assuming that that word was doctor, What's the probability of the next word being heals, eats, away, or riots? And we could again fill that in. And, and you could do this for an arbitrarily long period of time. If you decided that you wanted to actually select the words proportional to their probability, you'd then be able to simulate language like a chatbot does. There's a couple of important considerations you'll want to have in mind when you're building uh, n-gram language models. I suggest that you work with trigrams all the way up to five grams. There's, there is no hard and fast rule with how big your grams should be, but a lot of people in the natural language processing community use somewhere between three and five. They also don't always use the grams at a single level of resolution. So you might, for example, in your models, have them consider both information at the trigram level, but also the unigram level, and also even at the, the character level. Facebook's fast text library, for example, combines information at the character and word level to improve the performance of their models. Um, another thing that is important as you look at uh, either textbooks or papers that you read in the literature where n-gram models are used and they start speaking about things regarding language probability, you're going to notice that there's always a log that's wrapped around that probability structure. So they wrap it with a log and they use a sum instead of a product. I just want to point out here, as you do your reading through uh, the literature on your own time, that 
there's nothing magical about that log. It's there just to prevent numerical underflow because probabilities, if you multiply a ton of them out, start to get very small very quickly to a point that you can't represent them uh, easily within a computer. When you want to evaluate your language models, there's um, two approaches. There's a extrinsic evaluation, which in some ways is better, and then there's an intrinsic evaluation approach. So let's speak about extrinsic evaluation first. For an extrinsic evaluation, you measure the change in an application's performance after you've embedded your model within it. So for example, you probably have the text suggestion within Gmail or whatever other mail client you're using. Well, how does Google know whether their, their model that's generating that text for you is any good? Well, they might know because based on whether you used it or not. So if they gave a suggestion for a string you should use in your email, and you happen to accept that suggestion by including it, they know without any kind of explicit ground truth about you telling them directly that that was the right answer, that that was sort of good enough for their purposes. So they were embedding it in an application and they were able to figure out that it helps you. People can do that with spell checkers and all sorts of other things too. Now intrinsic evaluation, which is far more common when you're, for example, writing scientific papers is where you measure your model's performance independent of the application area. So the way you do this is by provisioning a model training set, validation set, and a test set. We're gonna be speaking about how you go about training and validating models in a subsequent lecture. I'm just touching on it here so that you're aware um, of the direction that we're heading. The performance metric, if you're going to be doing an intrinsic evaluation, is called perplexity. Uh, it's very common in the language model literature, you'll see it over and over again. It's the inverse probability of the test set normalized by the number of words. Basically, lower perplexity is better because it means there are less options that your model has to think about choosing from for a given word. 